Hi, my name is Paul Grogan, and in this video, I'm going to be telling you what I think about the game Aura et Labora, designed by Uwe Rosenberg and originally published by Lookout Games in 2011. This video, like all of my reviews, is only made possible through the support of my Patreon campaign. So, a big thank you to all of my Patreon supporters for making this possible. And if you like this video, then please give it a thumbs up and leave a comment. And if you're interested in supporting the channel, please visit www.patreon.com forward slash gaming rules. If you are a producer level and higher, you get to vote on what games I'm going to review. In Aura et Labora, you and up to three other players are running a monastery in the medieval era, in either France or Ireland. You will acquire land and construct buildings, create a working infrastructure for manufacturing prestigious items such as books, ceramics, ornaments and relics. During the game, you'll use food and energy to establish settlements in your territory, bringing you additional points at the end of the game. I first played the game back in 2011 when it first came out. It was a friend of mine who owned it. Thankfully for me, he was trimming his collection a few years later and I bought it off him second hand. According to BGG, I've played it 15 times, which sounds about right, and I've played it at all player counts, including the solo mode, which I've played a few times. In a nutshell, I love this game. And I don't use that word often. I like a lot of games and I think a lot of games are very good, even great. But there's just something about this game that makes it special. And it's not even my favourite Uwe Rosenberg game, but it's close. So why do I think it's great? Well, it just is. Thanks for watching. Isn't that enough for you? Actually, this video has been really interesting for me to create and just to try and think about the game and work out why I like it so much. Because the game isn't without some faults and I'll try not to be blinded by my love for it and give you a full review. The first thing that struck me when I played this game is all about the detail. Just looking over all of the cards filled with icons and numbers along with the almanac and the glossary which details everything and what it does. I just have a huge respect for the amount of time and effort that's gone into this game. It shows to me, along with the designer's reputation, that this game has been cleverly thought out, play tested a lot just to get these numbers right. One thing I like in games in general is gathering resources and then converting those resources to do other things. And that's what this game is all about. And there's loads of options to do just that. And different players will be doing different things depending on what buildings they construct. You will chop down trees for wood and turn that wood into barrels. You'll get wool from your sheep or convert them into meat at the slaughterhouse, make wine from grapes and so on. Of course, this is a Euro game where the only reason you're doing these things is to get the most points. The theme is there in the game in that the buildings do what you think they would do, but ultimately you're doing all of this just to get the most points and it's about efficiency of your actions. Many of the actions that you can do in the game are unlimited use. So here, for example, at the winery, you can convert any number of grapes into wine, which means if you go there when you've only got a few grapes, it's a bit of a wasted action. So you want to save things up before you go there. And this also applies to the resources. The production wheel is a really clever way of representing that resources are building up round after round. Instead of piling up tokens and then taking them all, you simply rotate the wheel one space and then the number in the middle tells you how many of that resource are there. So here there are four sheep. If I collect sheep, I get four of them and then I reset the sheep marker to zero. And in multiplayer, the timing of this is important because this production wheel is shared between all players. If I go and get the sheep, there's now none left for you, although there is always the joker marker. And I really like this mechanism in games. However, there is a bit of a thematic disconnect. Just because you chopped down your forest and got eight wood, why do I now only get two wood when I chop down mine? If that bothers you, then that might be an issue. And although there aren't a million counters on the production wheel, there are still a million counters in the game. Well, 450 of them. And I do like a game with a lot of counters, and in this game they're two-sided, with the different sides representing different things, although they're usually related. You just need to be careful not to accidentally flip them over. Uh, they had to do this, otherwise there would have been 900 counters in the game. Another core mechanism in the game is worker placement. Each player has three clergymen, two lay brothers and one prior, and one of the actions that you can do in the game is to place one of them onto one of your buildings and activate it, and then gain the benefit. The prior is special in that when you construct a building, if your prior is free, you can immediately place it onto the building that you've just built as a bonus action. Now, like all good worker placement games, there is a way that you can use your opponent's buildings. And the way that it's done in this game is a little different and quite clever. You don't actually place your own workers on their buildings. Instead, you pay your opponent money, issue them a work contract, and then you place one of their clergymen or they place one of their clergymen onto the building to gain the benefit. 
There's other subtleties about this that I won't go into detail here, but it works really well. You do, however, need to keep an eye on what the other players are building, which means seeing those cards over the other side of the table, which could be a bit tricky. And I know a few people have mentioned this as an issue. Just remember that if the buildings are all there in the middle of the table and there was one you wanted to use, but then another player builds it, it's still in the game. You just have to pay the owning player for the privilege of using it. So this game has just the right level of player interaction for me, which is mainly about timing. The production wheel, as I've mentioned, constructing the buildings that you want to build before the other players get to them, but even then you can still use them. The districts and the plots that you can buy are in ascending order of cost, so the early buyers get them cheaper. There's a ton of buildings available and a number of different strategies to take. So if you decided from the start of the game, you're going to build the whiskey distillery and you're going to produce lots of whiskey and use that to get points, but then somebody else did, well, you can still use their building, but you might want to consider a different strategy. I also like the overall graphical style of the game. It's Clemens France again, his stuff is usually great, and this game is no exception. There's a whole lot of information on the small cards, but it's all done in a very clear and intuitive way. One of the things that might catch you out when getting started with the game, well, first of all, it comes with four rule books. Well, not really all rule books, but there is a booklet for setting up the game, another one for the general rules, there's a more detailed eight page rule book, and then there's a 12 page glossary with details of all of the buildings and settlements. Now, whilst that's, this might be a bit confusing, this is a fairly complex game. So I think the way that they've done it is okay. I just know some people don't like it. And the other thing that tripped me up is that there are many different ways to play the game. You have a choice of playing in Ireland or France, which have some different setups and a completely different set of buildings. But also there are slightly different rules for the three and four player game. There's also changes if you want to play the short game, then there are the differences for a two player game, then differences for a long two player game, then there's the solo game. I'm saying this as if it's a problem and it's not. You just have to be really careful when you're setting up the game and reading the rules that you read the right part for the particular game mode that you're playing. And this brings me back to the first thing I said. The amount of detail in this game is definitely something that I can respect. And this is the reason why there are tweaks to the different player counts is because they are needed to make the game as good as it can be. And the fact that you know, there's an option of playing a short game is good too. And for how good the actual rule book is, it's well written, it's clear, it's concise, everything is covered. I had no ambiguities, then there was loads of images. I really like the glossary with the full details of everything. And the player aid is really good too. There's a lot of useful information on there. Components wise, everything is good. The copy I have is the original one from 2011 and the player boards are thin card. Now, I don't mind this as much as some other people do, but it was a strong enough criticism from many sides that they have actually made them thicker in the latest printing of the game. The resources are on good card stock. The cards are good quality. There's only a few wooden pieces in the game, but they're nice too. The only bit for me that was an issue was the production wheel, which just doesn't sit flat on the table properly and kept spinning around accidentally on its own. I fixed this by basically not putting it together as suggested, but instead putting the wheel directly on the table and then the plastic bit in from the top. It's a really minor thing. While we're talking about components, there's a lot of little things in this game. The relics, for example. Now, you might go a whole game and not make one of these, and there's a whole bunch of them included in the game, and each one of them has different artwork on. It's just one of those nice little touches that was completely unnecessary, but people like me appreciate. So let's talk about the variability in the game, because I love games with a lot of variability, and this game has absolutely none. Every time you play the game, it's the same buildings each time. They also even come out in a fixed order. All of the start buildings come out at the start. Then when you get to the A point, the A buildings come out and it's always the same ones. Now the buildings are different depending on whether you're playing France or Ireland. And with fewer than four players, you do take some of them out, but that's not the variability I'm talking about. A three player game set in Ireland will be exactly the same setup as the next three player game in Ireland with exactly the same buildings. Now, going back to what I said about love being blind, this isn't an issue for me. I've played this game a ton and will happily play it again, even though it's the same buildings. Now, some people need the variability. And I know a few people who've spoken to me about this in the last few days have commented that, that they wish there was more variability in the game. But for me, as I say, not an issue. The differences between France and Ireland are minor. There's no real rules changes and a few of the core buildings are the same, but it does provide an interesting few tweaks and differences. The solo game is enjoyable, but it simply has an objective of get 500 points. It's a challenge, sure, but because there's no variability, it's more of a puzzle. And it doesn't even mention the beat your own score, which I know some people hate anyway, but it just says 
the goal's 500 points, which feels a bit odd. I feel it would have been nicer to have at least a sliding scale of points that you look up how many points you get, tells you how good you were. But I do like playing the solo game. It gives you some feel of the multiplayer game in that I'm still playing Aura at Labora and constructing buildings and converting resources, although it is missing the timing thing of the other players. But there's still other things that you need to think about. Playtime is listed as two to three hours, but it's so variable depending on player count and what mode you choose to play. Like there's a two player game and there's a two player long game, for example. Now my latest solo game took about 90 minutes and the recent two player tutorial and playthrough that I did was just over two hours, but it's gonna take longer with more players and obviously more for your first game as usual. For me though, the playtime is good. Turns go quickish and you can think ahead about what you wanna do, although you need to have a backup plan in case somebody steals your sheep. And that's everything. I hope you found this video useful in considering whether you wanna get the game or not, or if it's a game you haven't heard of before and think, why should I buy this old game? Then hopefully you've seen now why I think you should check it out. As mentioned at the start, this video has only been made possible thanks to the support of my Patreon campaign. So if you wanna support the show, check out patreon.com forward slash gaming rules. And since the quotes from other people that I did in my last review were popular, I'm gonna do the same thing at the end of this one. So thank you to those people for their quotes. Until next time, take care and thanks for watching.